Okay, I think we're ready to begin our uh, investor panel. Um, I would like investors to grab some microphones on the table and share them as you, as you, as you go. Um, so my name is Dolmudas, I'm co-founder and CEO at TransferGo, and today we have a group of, of European uh, investors who will be able to share their expertise. Um, my goal of this uh, panel is to shed some light on the life and then decision-making process of an investor for the entrepreneurial growth. So I'll try to ask you some questions, spice it up a bit, so be as open as you can. That would be truly appreciated both by me and by the crowd that's, that's there. So before we go into questions, I'd like to just briefly introduce yourself, which fund do you represent and what's your focus of investment, both in how early do you invest and what's the, if there is a sector focus as well. Does it work? Should this work? Hello, there we go. Uh, so I'm Sam Myers, I'm an associate with uh, Balderton Capital. So we're, uh, we're a London-based VC fund. We've been investing in Europe for about 15 years now. Um, we started off as the European arm of Benchmark Capital, so one of the larger US venture capital funds, um, and then began raising as Balderton in 2007, 2008. So we focus on Series A investments um, across Europe. So uh, about 50% of our investments will be in the UK and 50% will be, uh, be around Europe. Um, and when it comes to sectors and, uh, and technologies, it's quite broad. So we'll do anything from enterprise software and middleware to consumer mobile, um, quite a bit of e-commerce and marketplaces, and a few sort of ad hoc and in interesting industries uh, that hopefully will grow in the future. So 3D printing, um, a little bit in digital health, so quite broad. Yaron uh, Kniazer, I'm from Israel, from uh, Rhodium. It's a family-owned uh, VC. We invest mainly in Israel and in the U.S., starting to look on Europe, but we still don't have presence here. Mainly pre-A round, um, consumer internet, payment, e-commerce, some ad tech companies. This is usually uh, our space. Margus Udam from Ambient Sound Investments, which is Skype co-founders, multifamily office based in Tallinn. And um, our focus is software. Um, and, and seed and A rounds, and it's probably easier to say we don't do semiconductors and life sciences and anything else we are interested to take a look. So we are in a process of fundraising right now to set up a new fund. The focus will be Europe and similar stages, similar focus. I'm uh, Marcin Heika. Uh, I'm a managing director at uh, Intel Capital. We are an investment arm of, or venture, venture capital arm of uh, Intel Corporation. We, we invest in the whole spectrum of, uh, of new economy, uh, with particular focus recently on uh, the Internet of Things, wearables, security, uh, big data, education, but, uh, but covering a much broader spectrum of opportunities. Uh, starting from digital home, digital office, etc. Uh, we've been investing in Europe for roughly 16, 17 years. And uh, so far we invested in 60 countries. We invested close to, uh, globally, not, not just in Europe, we invested close to $12 billion and we, we are adding roughly 400 million, 400, 500 million dollars in new investments every year. We are stage agnostic, uh, investing from uh, seed stage to, to public company stage. Uh, average deal size for us is roughly four to five million, but, but we can do 100,000 opportunities. We can do, we can do 100 million uh, investments. Uh, my name is Mindo Gazglodis. I'm a partner in Nextury Ventures. Nextury Ventures is a uh, boutique investment uh, fund, uh, completely privately funded, that operates currently in Lithuania only. That is, we invest in teams in Lithuania, but in those teams that have a vision for a global uh, product, specifically in uh, IT, uh, 3D printing, uh, mobile internet, and uh, marketplaces. So, uh, yeah, we are an early stage fund. 
when I say boutique, I mean that we also have a very strong focus on staying extremely close to our uh, startups, basically providing them a lot of uh, facilities and a lot of help you would expect an incubator uh, to provide. And our model is focused on early stage only. We help those companies reach the stage where they can successfully seek uh, follow-on investment from other VCs and angel investments from uh, Silicon Valley and other parts of the world. Cool. Um, my name is uh, Linus Dog. I work for a VC fund in London called Wellington Partners. So we're a European fund focusing on primarily German markets, so German-speaking countries, the Nordics and the UK. And with the Nordics, I sort of add in with an extension with, to the Baltics as well. Um, so it's only software that we invest in, primarily B2B. So I'd say 70% of our deals is B2B and 30% are consumer-focused. Um, sort of we do seed to Series A, meaning somewhere from three, 400,000 uh, euros up to rounds of up to like 5 million or so. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, uh, thank you a lot for this introduction. Um, let's begin with the first question, which is um, it's usual th thinking process that us entrepreneurs have to chase the investors to get their money. Let's turn the table upside down a bit and let's talk about the deals that you tried to chase and couldn't get. What would be the defining characteristics of those companies? If you can name those companies, please do. If not, just talk about the characteristics of those exquisite companies that you are actually looking for and want to get in the market. Sorry, what was that? The, the companies that we were chasing and couldn't get? Yes. And what were defining why we wanted to? Yes, make? yes. Um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cop out and take the easy answer, which is always that the team is incredible. Um, and usually you see some kind of momentum that makes it a very competitive deal. And I think in terms of... Um, of why we might not have gotten to that deal, I think it would just be more conviction and spending time with the team. So I think once you realize that you want to invest, you need to be absolutely sure. And if you are, you go and you spend days, if not weeks, with the team in their office trying to convince them that you're going to be the right partner for them. I will not say names or things like that, but I would say that entrepreneurs need to understand that we are always also chasing and also selling ourselves to the entrepreneurs because we need to build the brand and the recognition that the best entrepreneurs will come to us because anyone around here, if we're not be able to attract the best entrepreneurs, will not be successful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a continuous effort from our end. And then of course we can discuss what, what is make to what what is uh, the best team and what does it make to to be attractive to VCs, but that I think is another uh, discussion. So I think in most cases we, we have lost some deals because of speed. And, and there have been cases like startup is coming to our office, we have a meeting, we really like it. And, and he heads to London, calling at the same night, hey, I got term sheet, <laughs> can you provide yours today? So, um, and then we feel comfortable to act, for example, that fast. So, um, so a couple of these cases we, we have missed because just of just speed. Right, so it's, it would be fair to say that if you, if you are interested, you would move faster than, than in other cases, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name the names, but uh, 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 there were some occasions where basically we didn't invest we, because we... We didn't believe the, uh, the valuation was right, for example. You know, I think that one, uh, uh, in, in one case, basically, or in a couple of cases, basically the company that was at, this, at a stage of, of basically PowerPoint pre presentation without any, any product, any customers, was, was expecting pretty high valuation. Uh, some of them actually did very well, and we looked back and was scratching our head whether we made a mistake, whether we actually should have invested. But uh, we actually concluded that we did the right thing because like, you know, lowering the bar too much, you know, just for one deal probably could have resulted with 10 other bad investments. So 
So, so I think um, you know, it's uh, we we have certain process, certain certain criteria, and uh, we are trying to stick to it, even if it sometimes means that we are not going to win every deal. Well, uh, we are relatively new. We are, you know only exist for 18 months or so, so no big regrets yet. However. Not, not real regrets, but we have pushed back uh, on some teams and some uh, ideas, some, tar some startups that look very good. And that was sometimes because of our focus on very early stage. Because, you know, when a VC says, I'm operating in this stage, you, you have to stick to certain specific things you do or you don't do. And, and you know, valuation comes in and so on. So in many cases, we, we told the teams, you look, you look good. We believe in this idea, but we will not invest uh, because you are far more advanced than actually we could help you. And this was the focus us, and you know we would not be able to provide the value we believe we would provide for other guys. So you know, th and then what we do because because of our nature, we have quite some relationships with other VCs. Then you know we would make references to other guys, saying you know, talk to them; they might be more interested in you than we are. So on, on the first question, I mean, I would agree with the fact that it's about team. It usually makes the, the main difference. Uh, obviously, initial traction can be uh, just the same thing. So you see something that's just about to take off. I mean, I think everyone wants to move really quickly. Um, if we talk about some deals that we've missed out on, um, for example, I can, I'm not going to mention exactly which one it is, but if you know a bit about the space, then you'll know which one it is anyway. So I'll do that at least. So there was this Swedish company that we looked, for, looked at for quite some time. They did a... Uh, three million US dollar round uh, seed deal and uh, in the sort of 3D modeling space. So I'm going to give you as much as that. There are like three of them. So you can do your, uh, your own math by now. Um, we missed out on that one for a couple of reasons. We weren't fast enough, number one. Um, couldn't get the partnership to agree fast enough compared to other ones, uh, which happens. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing, but it happens. Second part is valuation. So we thought it was about a certain level that we thought we were comfortable with from a financial return point of view. Um, and I'd say the third issue is also when you sort of have a discrepancy between the VCs and the founding teams in terms of value add. I think we thought we can bring more value, meaning we should actually have a slightly higher stake as well uh, compared to um, some of the other guys. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for being as open as you could. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a long shot, but you, thank you for your answers. Um, I think a few things that come up from this is first is speed to deal. So if they like you, they'll probably go move faster than the next guy. So the dynamics of the deal. Then we have the valuation, and we'll touch upon early stage valuations because a lot of these people, and including me myself, I'm, I'm sometimes bewildered of how the valuations are being designed, you know, from, from unicorn to, uh, you know, 7 million in like no time at all. So, and then of course, the right fit and the right team. So maybe we can go into your decision making process so that, you know, all the, all the entrepreneurs there who are trying to get your money, they need to understand on how you go from meeting a person to actually giving them money in their pockets. So could you maybe give a top tip about what's the best way to build a relationship with the fund? such as yours, to progress as quickly as possible and to capture that momentum at the end, get the money. And whoever, whoever wants to start, you can, any order. I can start again. Um, so I think, uh, and I guess this is a little bit, I guess counterintuitive in, in some ways, but the best way to be fast when it's time for the round and you need the money is to make sure that you are already engaged to begin with. So that if you know the fund, you know the people in it, you know what they're looking for, um, and the fund has a lot of context on the founder in the market and so on, they can move quite fast. It's very difficult to move fast when you're uncertain about the market, you don't know the team, it's just, it makes it very, very difficult for us to, to make the decision quickly. What is typically fast versus not, like in your fund, you would say, like the ones that you close, on average, how quickly does that go? Again, it's difficult to say because we've been in discussions with them for a long time before it comes to, to, comes to that point. But I guess from beginning of a formal fundraising process to end could be anywhere in sort of four to six weeks if it's, if it's a, a regular process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done the fastest we've done, I think, is about three weeks from, um, you know, I had a relationship with an entrepreneur and then brought it to the partnership uh, very quickly onwards after that and then... Uh, that specific deal was a convertible round. I know um, 
so we got in very, very quickly. Had uh, two meetings with a guy as a partnership, and then we sent over the money. Um, I think it was three, yeah, from when I met him in actual fundraising mode, then it was three weeks from that point till we had money in the bank. Okay, maybe some specifics from the very early stage fund. So sometimes we are not even investing in companies. We are investing in ideas where we find a person, an individual or a group of individuals that you know, share similar ideas. It takes us some time, sometimes a week, sometimes maybe a couple of months to discuss and align our visions, to align our understanding if what they want to do and what they understand what they're going to do is exactly what we kind of envision. And you know, if we agree on that, then it's just uh, setting the deal. And uh, in our case, uh, we don't bother really with sophisticated valuations. We start low and then we see how it goes because our fundamental belief is if you have the right, if you have managed to attract the right people, you can reward them afterwards and, and you know, have it in, in, in some sort of agreement what their participation in that future uh, company will be. So honestly, we have, uh, we, we call them projects because they're not companies. They, they are not a legal entity. We're incubating them. Once we validate the idea, once we validate that the people that committed to do that are capable to do that, we move on. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in, in my case, the, the fastest deal took two weeks uh, and we completed between Christmas and New Year. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, obviously end of year is, uh, has, has kind of, you know, magical power of, of, of accelerating processes. But uh, this case was kind of special. We invested in one of the winners of, uh, of uh, competition for, for startups that, that Intel is organizing. Mm, you, may, you may remember last year in Vilnius we had uh, EMEA finals of Intel Business Challenge. And uh, this year we are organizing another competition like that, uh, Challenge App uh, for IoT companies. And in many cases, when we like really companies that, uh, that are participating in those competitions, we can move incredibly fast. For us, kind of, you know, the, pro the, the competition itself is kind of due diligence. So, so whoever is the winner, we, we kind of, you know, we feel comfortable and we can propose the, the deal pretty much right away. And, uh, and the com if the company is fine with what we propose, we can close, as mentioned, within two weeks. The standard uh, uh, is a bit longer, and uh, for us, kind of the standard speed is around two to three months. So this is the, the typical horizon. But of course, we need to remember that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a two-way process. So basically, the pace not depends not only on the investor. It also depends on how well prepared the company is how quickly due diligence goes, how quickly the company is able to address any potential questions. And uh, uh, one advice I would have to, to, to all companies is that, remember, it's, uh, it's a two-way process. So, so uh, you know, to the same extent as, uh, as, as investors will investigate you, you should investigate your investors. And, you know, don't waste time contacting everyone from the list of whatever, EDCA or, or, or BBCA. Uh, uh, make sure you contact the investors that, uh, that may be interested in what you do. You know, quite often I, uh, we receive like uh, uh, proposals coming from companies that, and those proposals are pretty much, you know, sent to entire distribution list uh, from, uh, from EDCA or BBCA or, or whatever the location of the company is. Don't do that. Actually, number one, it's, uh, it, 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 it makes you losing a lot of effort and time, you know, on, on, on discussions that are not with, with, with people, with investors that will never be interested in what you do. Uh, and uh, kind of talking to limited group of investors that are specifically interested in companies that that operate in your space, that specifically are looking for investments the size you're looking for, who, who are at the right time of the fund life to, to be interested in investment is, the, is the, best, uh, the best spend of time and it may actually you know, help you to close the investment process faster. Mm -hmm. Just 
on the on the question of relationships. I think that was very important one. It sort of also goes together with the previous question. Usually, a fund is structured. You have managing partners, you have principals, and you have associates that basically help you know source the deals. So, uh, in my experience, you know, building a relationship with one of those people is critical, right? So, how would you suggest building relationships with associates or partners? Uh, before you, should you do it before you go into fundraising or you do it during fundraising? What would be yeah. your preferred strategy? So the, I, the answer I think is yes. I think um, it's very important to build a relationship even when you are not in a funding mode. Many times uh, the VCs will be happy to meet you at such a stage because it sometimes can be even a more open discussion because no one is selling anything, although we are always selling and buying. So try to build relationship. And for the previous question that you asked, I think one thing can you do, it's a delicate move, but try to build a sense of urgency into the process and try to manage the process because there are associates, there are partners, if any meeting is a step for another meeting, that can take, just this process can take a couple of weeks. So people need to be really assertive, not, too, not aggressive, but they need to, to manage the process toward the goal. For me, you know, I, I would encourage everyone to contact, uh, you know, the investors you, and, and, and have a discussion even if the project is not ready. So, for example, I, I'm, you know, my mobile phone is available to everyone. My email address is available to everyone. I always, even if I'm at the meeting, I always call back. You know, it's, uh, I'm always happy to, 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 to meet entrepreneurs, to meet companies, even if they are not ready, even if they are kind of slightly outside of the scope. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, 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 you know it, it, it establishes relationship, it enables the dialogue. You know, even if it's not relevant, even, even if what you do is not relevant for the fund and will never be, it's a... F you know, the investment is five minutes, you know, so, so it's, 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 no one is going to be angry. You know, I'm, I'm always happy, happy to have a coffee meeting and, and spend an hour, you know, discussing the, the product, discussing market opportunities, discussing potential synergies. And actually, I had a number of situations where basically I, I you know, which started from a cold email or cold uh, phone call. Uh, which turned into like, you know, a year and a half or two year long dialogue, which ended up with investment. So, so you know, don't, uh, don't be shy, you know, reach out to investors. And you know, I, I, I think it will be, it, it may end up with something beautiful. I, I just would like to add to that, that, you know, typically a startup is very focused on doing something and has very good ideas on, you know, what's the future for, for their idea. Now, on the investor side, uh, it, it's different kind of people. Sometimes they are very focused on a specific subject, but typically they have to deal with a very broad range of subjects. And in some cases, they might not be very uh, knowledgeable. And this is, I think, in a way, a fine art and the intuition, but also something that comes with the experience for a startup to understand, you know, at the right time when whether it makes sense to pursue this relationship and try to educate the investor on what you're doing and what the future of this thing is and where it is time to say no stop it he, he's not gonna be interested in this also beware of the situations you know sometimes you look at what the uh, uh, funds are investing in and, and uh, you know you approach them thinking that once you invested into uh, you know something they will invest into my idea because it's so similar and sometimes it might exactly be the case because the, the fund manager could see the synergy of these two things but very often it might be even a dangerous situation where you know they will talk to you very nicely because it's very interesting for them to talk they have their own investment that they're taking care of right so it's a fine art where you have to uh, you know find your own way of uh, behaving but really, you have to be active to be successful. You, you can't just stick with one conversation and, and you know, invest all your time into that. It's, it's an open market. And in the Baltics, it is still a very small market. It is an emerging market. There isn't that many people uh, to talk to. So, uh, you know, really, uh, reach out as far as you can. 
and uh, it will take longer these discussions it will take longer to knock on the door before it even opens to have a conversation but eventually it might yield the much better result mm -hmm. uh, yeah. just a quick thing I mean could you ask a little bit about the sort of associate versus principal versus partners I thought I'd touch upon that quickly as well uh, so first of all before getting there um, there's some people say ABS which means always be selling uh, and that you should always do no matter what it is there's not a you know, formal fundraising time. There's always time to talk to people because you'll learn something, hopefully. If you have to do, deal with you know, decent people, they're going to give you good advice and good feedback on whatever it is. Second part of that is it's always better to ask for advice than ask for money. Um, it's a cliche, but it's actually true. Um, then coming back to the sort of associate principal partner level, I think it comes down to the fun. Um, and it depends on the size of the partnership as well. But what you don't want to be stuck with, and I'm an associate myself, so I'm going to say it out loud as well, is the fact that you don't want to be stuck with only meeting an associate either, or a principal for that matter, if they don't have enough traction in that partnership. So it's super important that an associate or a principal in that specific case have a good channel to either at least one partner, or it can bring it up. So very early on, you take it to the partnership and discuss it there in an early stage, even when they're not raising. Um, because at the end of the day, it is the partnership is going to make the call, meaning GPs, not associates. We might love it. We might get the question in the partnership saying, if this is the one deal you do this year, is this the one you're doing? I've said yes once uh, to that question because it's your career on the line for that as well. Right, so it would be fair to say that, you know, associates usually are gatekeepers. You get them through the door, but then the deal is we're going to be made by the other people. So it's going to be multiple people that you have to engage over, the, over your fundraising. Absolutely, and you need always one partner to sort of be, to take the lead for that one as well. So in, it depends on the partnership again, but I mean, for example, I have two companies that are mine and I'm an associate, so it can differ depending on partnerships, but in, you know, to generalize, yes, absolutely. All right. Um, maybe move on to another topic, which is uh, what I've realized over the last two or three years and multiple com multiple companies is that not every great business is a great investment deal for a VC, right? Um, and many of these entrepreneurs here, they want to get VC money and maybe not necessarily know if it's the right money. They just heard that it's cool, that you, know, you can get a lot probably. And uh, so maybe if you get your thoughts, why not every great business is a great VC opportunity? So I think, um, and I've had this discussion a few times, um, I think when you take on VC money, it changes the expectations quite a lot. So the bigger the fund, the bigger the business needs to be to be able to cover all the losses from our investments that don't do very well. Um, and so I was speaking to one of our venture partners at the last fund I was at who said that essentially he, he founded a quite successful um, uh, real estate company in the US, so an online real estate company. It was doing very, very well, but he had some very large funds from the West Coast with him on the ride. And even though it would have been a great company for him, it wasn't for them. And so for them, it became very binary. Sort of, okay, we need it to become this size, otherwise it's actually meaningless for me. So there are some businesses that can grow to very, very good businesses for the founders, and they can do very well off them, but they don't necessarily work with a big fund. Right, and for a VC, like generally, uh, would growth in the early stage would be more interesting than revenues in the early stage? Depending on the business, depending on the business. But yeah, I'd say if there's, if there's momentum and there's some sight of a way to monetize it in the future, then it's almost, it's almost not worth having the initial small revenues to distract the investor from what is actually quite good momentum. Yeah, so focus on engagement momentum rather than depending getting, on the business. Depend, of course, yeah, yeah. If, you're a, if you're a strict B2B business and no one's willing to pay for your product, and you have an issue. I think the, um, your answer shows the difference between a Series A and let's say a Series C. Um, and I think your question is two different questions. There are great businesses that are not for VCs. Usually it's uh, like a e-driven business. We want things that can be very, uh, very large like the $1 billion dreams, and you can build an amazing local business here, and you don't need the VC with you. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Your okay, second question, as a seed investor, I'm less concerned with the actual monetization at such an early stage. 
What I am concerned is to be able to have a smart discussion with the founders to get his take on what he's going to do with it in the future. Just to see that I understand the economics of the business, but I'm not looking into monetization at such an early stage. Right. Yeah. So, so actually the answer summarizes a few questions you, you had earlier as well. And, and it really, there are very few startups who consciously do pre-marketing, building relationship early on, saying, this is what I do, this is, you know, our plans, learning more about the VC, saying we are not fundraising right now, but we are planning to do it, you know, in this time frame and so on, building these expectations and understanding the particular VC, you know, at which phase they are investing. In our case, would you be comfortable investing in pre-revenue phase or should we have early traction in place? And it Combined it all, I mean, it increases probability that when the speed is essence in the closing, that it all will end up in, in a proper way. So I would, I would really suggest startups to focus more or bring more the kind of pre-marketing element to, to fundraising process as well. No, maybe I just want to add one uh, thing that, uh, you know, a typical VC looks at the company as, uh, you know, some entity where value can be added and then that VC can get rid of that company and earn much more money. So if it takes for that company, you know, in, in between those uh, times to, you know, generate revenues and, and, and be profitable and so on, that's even better. But it's not necessary as long as you grow value. And I think you will know the Skype example very well. I mean, it, it has never been a, a very profitable company, right? But it has created such an amazing value that, you know, somebody else came along and said, we've been working on this for years, for decades, and we're not able to build it. And you did. And you know the size of that deal. Yeah, so I can uh, speak for myself. And from, uh, from our perspective, you know, lack of revenue is not a problem. Uh, you know, stage is not a problem. Uh, a couple of elements matter. So, so n number one, uh, we will not invest if we are not able to add value. So, so even if we see fantastic, fantastic opportunity, you know, growing incredibly fast, if we don't understand the segment, if we, if we don't have expertise, if we are not able to help the company in the growth, we would, not, we would not invest. We, we want to be a value-added investor. We don't want to be just money. Uh, and, and, and we would feel uncomfortable investing even in, in, in kind of high-growth businesses if we don't understand what's behind the growth. Uh, in, in other kind of opportunities that we, that we feel a little bit worried about, typically, is our businesses were the success mean is a function of know who rather than know how. So there are sectors where we, which are incredibly competitive, incredibly crowded, where uh, the success is purely a function of, uh, of, of an individual leading the company, having the right network, having, knowing the right people, and, and using his connections to, to make the company successful. And uh, those kind of opportunities are typical, typically difficult to exit from. And, and, and depending, depending on individuals, so we are, we are trying to stay away from it. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, many investors, is, uh, including ourselves, are, are, are generally very cautious about uh, uh, certain markets, uh, you know, for, for anyone having like, you know, uh, many institutional LPs as backers investing in gambling or, or anything related to, 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 to alcohol or cigarettes would, uh, would, be, would be a major problem. Uh, yellow flag for me is, is also um, dependence on regulations or, or permits or concessions which are issued by, by the states and uh, uh, and, uh, and significant business uh, being, you know, coming from, uh, from, from, from the public sector. 
uh, it's not a showstopper, but, uh, but it raises concerns because, like, you know, if the business depends on, on, on regulations that may change, you know, it, uh, it, it is a risk factor. Uh, so I, be, I believe those are, those are probably the key elements which, uh, which would make me, uh, you know, cautious or not investing in, 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 in companies that otherwise would be looking great. So, so first of all, I, I think we should sort of uh, differentiate between institutional VCs and non-institutional VCs because um, the, f the fundamentals of funds are just very different. I actually wrote a blog post about how institutional VCs look at VC math, so sort of, which is very good, you know, proxy for when a company can be a very good company, but it doesn't yield the return that institutional VCs need. So um, it's basically about, you know, the fact that we make bets in certain cases, and we usually promise 20% IRR, you know, over, te over 10 years, which in effect usually ends up being like 3x on the fund. So you have a $100 million fund, you're going to have to deliver 300 million back. Um, okay, I'm, I'm simplifying this case a, a little bit with management fees and holding times and so on. But that means that usually, like, the, I think the European statistics or average is like 50% of startups fail. Uh, so if we take that proxy, that means the fact that you have 50 million of that fund needs to return 6x on average. Um, the likelihood of you finding companies out of 20 portfolio companies, half of them have failed, 10 will do 6x on average, not very likely. So that's why you need to find the ones that can return at least 10, but preferably up, upwards 30x. Right. You need a couple of those home runs. Therefore, if a company gets sold for like 3 or 4x, that's actually a bad thing for the fund because they might think maybe we push this company to the next strategic valuation level and it can do 15 X instead. Right. So um, when you take on institutional VCs, you're in it to take this. It, it has to be a home run. That's mm -hmm. the goal. It should be a unicorn. Jason Lemkin wrote a fantastic blog post about it this week. So check that out as well. Mm -hmm. So this is like, like for a VC, you have to you know, think big and think as big as you can because that's, that small chance to a big win it's probably going to be so much more interesting than something quite sensible uh, going forward. And here I want to segue into local versus international. And we are and here in, in our ecosystem, which has grown a lot over the last three years, I still see a lot of, of, of people who come and say, you know, I have this idea, I'm going to test it in the Lithuanian market, and then with this traction, I'm going to raise more money from European VCs and go, go these steps, right? Rather than going for a bigger market because you're sort of scared of those bigger markets to go and test there. What would be your advice to these, to these entrepreneurs? Should, should they you know, usually go for the bigger market and try there, or should they stick in their local markets to have a test? Yeah, so I, you know, we, globalization is reality. And uh, if you take a look at uh, consumption, global technology consumption, it's highly concentrated in, in, in few markets. So like, you know, if you, if you take a look at overall software consumption globally, 50% of global software consumption is, is happening in the United States. 30% in European Union, 10% in Japan, and the remaining 10% in Russia, China, India, Africa, the rest of Asia Pacific, Australia, and Latin America combined. And if you take a look at, uh, at many kind of, you know, uh, younger markets like IoT wearables, the disproportion will be even higher. Uh, so so basically, basically, the question I would ask is like, you know, if you have technology that, that has an advantage, that is leading, don't waste time. Go where the customers are. Every unused opportunity becomes a threat. And, uh, and why waste time in, you know, because even entire Central Eastern Europe combined, you know, not even mentioning any of the Baltic countries, is probably, you know, one or a few percentage points of technology consumption globally. So, so uh, I think that, you know, and Israel is the best example, that the, the best model, the, the, the model that is the most successful. I, w I wanted to say, yeah. I wanted to use uh, Israel as an example. Yeah, so it, it's like use the brains you have locally 
and build bridges to where your customers and consumers are. So uh, my, my short answer will be move fast outside of the local market to the real market. And as you said, the Israeli entrepreneurs, they are not looking on Israel. Israel as a market is not interesting, it's not relevant. The US market is relevant, Europe is relevant, Asia is relevant. Israel specifically, usually we are going to the US uh, from, uh, because of different reasons. But so if you are here, even if you look here, you have investors that are not local, people from London, they are also your customers. If you are a CEO that want to build a large company, my advice will be move as fast as you can to the real market. Don't waste your time here. That's my advice. Yeah, I just wanted to, to build on top of what, what you said, because I, one of the statements you said, move as fast as you can. And I think, you know, making sure you can move outside is very important, because moving outside is, is in many cases, multiple times more expensive uh, than to test this idea here. But don't overplay, don't play too long here. So uh, for a startup that's just boost, bootstrapping, probably it's not very acceptable. Uh, but in, if you have a significant investment or a sufficient investment, move out. I would just say any general recommendation, they will, it will not be right any time. Try to make it interesting also. So. But. Any, any other ideas, comments, views? So we, we made an exit last week uh, from London-based Vahanda, which is marketplace for health and beauty. And, and based on that experience, actually, I would say it would be really hard if, if someone is really active in London doing the business and you are active here in Lithuania doing the same business. It is close to impossible to acquire London market if it's already there, someone growing very fast, raising money very fast, you can be only acquisition target for that one. So um, I would really encourage again to, to move to the target market where there is possibility to become the biggest one, either in Europe or globally, whatsoever. So rather than you start in local market, maybe it takes off, you start to like it, you know some revenue comes in, your kind of ambition might even, you know, come lower because you're a bit on a safe side already. So, um, so again, advising, I mean, and, and quite often tests in local market does not validate like anything because the customer behavior, market dynamics is, is, is different than, for example, in your key target market. So um, that's the conclusion. This is a very, very important point. Like the same user in the Baltics probably is not worth the same user in Germany. And I think like having conversations with Vinted as well, I mean, for them, raising six million in Germany was so much more important than any other Baltic presence. So, you know, this just comes to the point that pick your markets very well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Any more comments on this or? No. Okay, um, so let's, let's move on to valuations the most uh, bizarre and magical theme that you can have. You know, we talked about unicorns, we talked about billion dollar valuations. I mean, um, how do you go about evaluating early stage startups that are pre-revenue? How do you evaluate pretty much ideas and teams? What is your decision making process? I'm not asking about numbers here. No, it's like, I think we need another panel just for that. But just about how do you think about stuff that is very difficult to quantify. It may be to be disappointed because everyone will say similar things when it's a cliche, but it's really, it's about the people. Early state, that's it, it's just the people. We are going to build a relationship with you, with anyone we invest for six, six seven, ten years, at least. And maybe even build a relationship for uh, more years for the next uh, company. So it's, it's, like, it's like a marriage. So when we meet someone, we want to feel that we want to work with this guy or woman for many years. That's the number one. It's even more than the idea because in the last panel, people talk about pivoting and the company at the next, it's, it's a very different animal than the company that you invested at the seed round. But still, so 
amazing team, show passion, and show that you know your, your market, your product, and just let us feel that you are someone that we really want to work with, that we, we believe in you, that uh, we are connected to, to your dream, to your passion. At an early stage, that's the most important thing. Now people can talk about like, a round and things. So I think, I think um, the process isn't actually that complex. I think fundamentally it's a negotiation at this stage because there's not much to go by. Um, and the process is generally, okay, how much does the business need to raise? What will you need it for? And um, how do we get a meaningful stake of that? And so usually the beginning of the negotiation will be, okay, meaningful stake is 20, 25, I guess, is the standard number. And then depending on momentum and competition against other VC funds, that will shift around that figure. But I think it's just basic arithmetic. <laughs> right. So 20, 25 is the worst case for you guys just when you're negotiating. You know, if someone comes out at 50%, you know, that's probably not the best deal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Coming back to, to what you said, 50% might be a good deal at an uh, extremely early stage, right? Because I think that uh, there are different mechanisms also that can support founders in the future rounds, you know, this, this uh, option pools and, and other stuff that can be used and can be pre-agreed. Once the team that's, uh, you know, building that startup can clearly show their value. But uh, the, the earlier that get, the, it gets, I think sometimes it's, it's the harder to get uh, an independent investor, right? You might have an angel, you might have a family whom you know, and he will put some trust into you. But, but if you are talking to the person you, you meet, uh, you know, not necessarily for the first time, but basically who doesn't know your track record, I mean, don't expect that somebody will put money as if you are already uh, proven uh, your capabilities and, and your own capabilities and, and uh, your idea. Mm -hmm. If I'm just going to add something to that, I think it's um, deal dynamics is super important both for valuation, for how fast a deal closes, whatever it is. So basically, who's in the driver's seat? Is it the VCs trying to get a syndicate together? Is it the entrepreneurs, the team themselves? If it's serial entrepreneurs, it's usually more pricey just because they're serial entrepreneurs. Um, I think valuation is not only, it's not only about what you do today when you strike the deal at this point, it's also just equally much about thinking about what's the right valuation level for the next stage. So it's about not just thinking about if we do seed, we want to make sure that there's room to grow into a healthy Series A level. And the same if we do Series A level, we want to make sure that there's a healthy bump to the Series B level. So both from our pers perspective in terms of ownership but also in terms of actual post money and pre money valuation. So it's about trying to see it's almost like a, I mean, it's a journey, right? So you need to plan for every single step. Okay. Uh, maybe a quick question on early stage, because a lot of, invest, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially first timers, they, and I get this in many conversations, they think that if I can raise as little as possible, my uh, chance of success increases. Is that usually the case? For you, or is it all about the plan and how much you actually need versus as little? So, the way that we see it is the we have a very basic uh, question: is how much money do you need between 12 to 18 months, and what's the roadmap? Usually, if you raise for 18 months, the question will be where will it be in 12 months, because our assumption is that it will take you between four to six months to raise the Series A. So, and then. It's up to you to come with a valid plan. Now remember, we are talking valuation. I believe that it's a very simple uh, discussion. People know that it will be between 20 to a third, 40 percent uh, holding in early stage. I don't believe in taking uh, more, by the way. That's my personal belief. And I'm, my recommendation for you is don't manage the round uh, through an Excel. If someone won a third of your uh, company and is a good investor, don't waste two, two weeks negotiating, giving him 25% because you will lose him. Okay. Um, so we are trying to bid, let's say, if it's a one million from that, you can derive the valuation. If someone wants five million, it's a double digit valuation. So it's, it's a simple question. Mm -hmm. That's the discussion that we have 
презента паранозата, енергията е чистотата. So about small, smaller rounds and valuations, I must say that we are afraid of very small investments and rounds, just because statistically, whenever we have made like really small investments, 50k or so, just the higher is the probability of failure. So we have very clearly correlation in our portfolio as well. The smaller investment we make, the higher is the probability of failure. And, and, and quite often it's, the entrepreneur thinks, you know, maybe this is a amount I can grab. And, and it's small and maybe they give it to me. And it's not really thinking about what it takes to build in one year or, you know, whatever time frame, substantially higher valuation. And, and, and so it is tempting for angel investors as well who are doing their first deals. You know, they're asking only 20K or 50K, I can do it. But it burns out in six months. Two months after, you need to start new fundraising. The focus goes, goes there. So in early stage, for us, it is more important than we put a bit more money in. It is not about optimizing stake in early stage, but optimizing probability of success where you could follow on with A round and, and, and you know, make it, make it reasonable business. So, um, right. so, so, so asking 20K or 50K just because maybe I get it, it's kind of dangerous way for everyone. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is like, it increases the risk if you just ask for not enough, and it maybe also shows that you don't know what you're doing in many times because you think you can build a billion dollars with 50,000, probably not gonna happen, right? Yeah, the, if, the, the rule of thumb is that the, the funding should be sufficient to grow the business for approximately 18 months. You know, raising, raising a fund is a major effort, consuming a lot of uh, management time, but is not used for growing the business. So doing, doing this too often <laughs> can have a negative impact on, uh, on, on the growth of the business. So, so the company should have enough runway after raising money to be able to grow the business and to, to be ready to demonstrate significant growth uh, before raising the next round. And, you know, there's no golden standard here. I will, the, the, the rule of thumb I'm using is 18 months, but it may be 12, it may be 24 but it shouldn't be less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and quick, quick, maybe follow up on, on that, uh, because there is obviously salaries, marketing, and you know, a lot of founders may think that I maybe will starve myself a bit, pay myself a bit less. Is that something that you would tolerate, encourage, or you would say, you know, get your proper salary in place and let's, let's focus on what happened uh, to make it happen? Like, what's your view? Uh, would you, do you think that entrepreneurs should sacrifice their you know, good living for that time? No, I, I, I think we need, to be, we need to be reasonable. No one is expecting, you know, the entrepreneur to, to, to you know, not getting any salary or, or starving or not having money to, to go on holiday. I think we need to be reasonable. But uh, we also need to understand, and, uh, and it's good, uh, it's good if, if, if entrepreneurs understand it as well, is that, you know, the company stock is the, is the most valuable currency that, uh, uh, you know, this is really the currency that, uh, that makes, the, you know, talented people to leave kind of high-paid corporate jobs and join startups. So, um, so, so I, think, I think that, you know, we, we, on the one hand, you know, we, we understand, investors should understand founders and managers should be paid and should have normal life. On the other hand, you know, the, uh, the success will come at exit to everyone. So, so the, the founders or, or the managers should not expect to be, to be getting rich just based on salaries they are getting. So um, I, I agree, it is a kind of fine balance between fun and pain <laughs> that should be the kind of level of, of income because we have, we have really seen in a couple of cases where entrepreneurs become employees in their own company. So, and, and this is a kind of a bit dangerous side of, of aiming for two higher salaries. And of course, there are no certain rules in place, but in general, we have seen like 25% less from market level, the salaries to be. But actually, then later on, it becomes interesting as well. So let's assume it's widely successful and the company valuation is like 1 billion, but the guy still has salary of 
all, all his fortune is in stock and salary is still fairly slow, uh, low. So, and, and in some cases, then founders might have a bit like distorted view and it might make sense, for example, go for secondaries. Something to give, give to founders already in a in later stage where it's all clear, but you see that the ambition stays still in place. For example, if there is no secondary, we have seen a few cases that founders are like too anxious to go for exit when the company is still growing very well and the focus might, might change a bit. So um, let's say the dynamics change over time, how you handle it. Yeah. But secondary is usually, you know, they usually happen up in B, C rounds a bit, yeah, a bit yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. No yeah. one will have part yeah. in A rounds. Yeah. Well, those who don't know secondaries is when pretty much invest, other investors buy your shares and you can, as a founder, get some money in. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add for those who are maybe considering uh, looking for the investment for the first time. In my opinion, founder is just another word for investor. The only difference is that investor would typically you know, invest money and some time. Now, the founder invests all of his time, the 24 hours of the day, and, you know, also gets, uh, you know, some, uh, some money to support himself in this initial growth stage. And then I fully agree with Margus, as, as the company matures, then this should change, but not in the early stage. Sure. Um, I think we have around four minutes left, and uh, I hope that We'll get some good questions from the stage, well, not from the stage, from the, from the audience here. You know, it's all about you, this panel. I tr we try to make it as relevant as possible. Maybe we'll be able to tell if it was or not. But if, please, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and someone will give you a microphone. You can see one guy who should ask a question. No? Anyone? Yeah, they will invest if you ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> One seat closed right there. I mean, <laughs> okay, I, I don't have a question, but since you are willing already to invest, if I make a question, can we have an interview afterwards? <laughs> Who would like to have an interview with me? I'm a startup from Hamburg. Um, we're currently working on a on a on a product for uh, wearables for the smartwatch, and we're willing to make friends first. We're not searching for money right now, we're making friends, and that's what I'm searching. Who would like to do that? Okay, I'll you talk as well. With you as well. Thank, Thank you very much. This gentleman was obviously listening to our conversation here, which is good, always helps. Any other? Any other questions about fundraising, about how you're gonna get rich, about how you're gonna make investors rich? Okay, everyone knows everything, so maybe we can go with those tips about okay. top, tip, top tips about how to fundraise. So, so I'm going to give my best tip on how to get a uh, top of priority list on in any VC's email inbox. And it's super simple, referrals. So it's super simple, meaning that usually, let, let's take uh, us as an example. We look at about 2,000 deals a year. I still have roughly 400 emails in my inbox that I still haven't had a chance to look at. So how do you make sure that you get priority number one? You make sure that you get in touch with someone who knows us somehow through Twitter, through LinkedIn, whatever it might be, and they can make and vouch a little bit to, for you. That's where you know you'll get a response straight, straight away. Any other tips, top, top tips on fundraising from the investors? Yeah, I'm Lithuanian, so it doesn't really what I'm gonna say is not really valid for Lithuania because we don't have local uh, funds that focus in very different areas. They're all very general. But once you go abroad, it's very important that you do your research before you approach VCs and actually know what they have invested in and, and you know, try to make the best guess uh, if they would be uh, interested in investing in what you do. Otherwise, it might just be a total waste of time, total waste of resources. First of all, I'm, I'm jealous that you only have 400 emails, you know, unread in your inbox. I wish I had so few. Uh, 
You know, I, I think that, you know, we're about uh, what problem your solution, your product, your technology is solving. You know, very, very often, you know, the, you know one, one of the common mistakes I see is, is that, you know, we, we receive investment proposals that technically are perfect solutions to either non-existing problems or, or problems that are so marginal that, you know, five people globally would care. And uh, so, so make sure, make sure that, uh, that your product is, is, is really addressing the real need. Maybe following on, on, on that topic uh, a bit as well. So it is very interesting what is the motivation of founder. And, you know, sometimes you hear people, I want to make one billion dollar startup. And of course, it's, it's cool to, to hear and, and so on. But does it always lead to the right action? And so this is a kind of interesting point. If you, if you look at the successful startups, their aim is actually to help someone. Maybe it's a bit Buddhist view. <laughs> I'm not Buddhist here, but, but, but I have figured out that, that companies who really help someone to do something are getting to the right action sooner than later. And, um, and then also looking at the two maybe highest valuation companies in the world right now, Uber and Airbnb, I guess, are, are highest valued right now. Both of them, first of all, they use resources more efficiently. So you can use a seat in your car or go to your home. You basically use existing resources more efficiently. And secondly, you help people to make more money with the resources they already have. And it has led to kind of the highest valuations in the world right now. And it probably correlates a bit with the fact that, you know, the planet is overcrowded, we are using too much of the planet's resources, and the more efficiently we can use them, the better it is. And I'll, uh, to, to sort of balance out that high-level uh, tips, I'll go for some very granular practical stuff. So essentially, in, in a presentation, um, what I would always prefer is always start with the product, because the product, first of all, shows what you're doing, but second of all, reflects on everything else. So it reflects on the team, it reflects on the market, what people are doing today, and so on. <laughs> and then uh, a few very detailed points. So there are two slides that are quite unnecessary. One of them is the exit slide. I don't expect anyone to have a, an exit strategy at seed or series A. That's, uh, that's probably quite ridiculous. And, uh, and the second one is, you know that very neat table where you show all your competitors and the tick marks uh, against what you have versus them? Also show what you don't do. So where are you going to be focusing? Not only the fact that you do everything and your competitors do a third of the things that you do. That's pretty useful, I think. Just say, uh, manage the funding process as, as a project and, you know, um, do things that, for me, what you did, this is a good example for an entrepreneur, I don't know you, but you saw an opportunity and you did something. I'm always sometimes in the crowd, I want to ask questions, but I don't feel comfortable. You need to step outside of your comfort zone and to be assertive. So. Well, on that good note, uh, I think we are running out of time, so I would like to thank everyone for participating. And uh, from personal uh, for you, it's good to see same faces, familiar faces coming back to Vilnius uh, every login. I hope that we will see more first time. Yeah, so next time, you know, we'll see you here again. Um, and also, you know, from emails to to face to face, also very nice. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope you know we'll be able to invest in Lithuanian entrepreneurs sometime soon. So thank you, and round of applause.